Schmidt, president and partner at Foundry, the custom app strategy and design company, chats with Gary about why you shouldn't listen to your clients, how making the shift from selling a commodity level service to offering strategy can save your agency, and why you should always be hiring, even when you don't have an open position. This podcast is made by marketing entrepreneurs for marketing entrepreneurs. If you love creating something out of nothing and are hopelessly addicted to growth, you're one of us. Stop by each week to hear conversations with leading marketing entrepreneurs where we drill down on things like how to start and double your business, develop systems that can scale, and why success starts with who you are as a person. And after the episode, head over to the Agency Growth Engine server on Discord to talk shop and swap stories with the rest of our community. Let's dive in. All right, we are live. Thanks so much for tuning in. Now, if you can do me a favor, if these podcasts have been valuable to you and your agency, and as you're growing, please share this with somebody. I know you know other agencies, so just take a second, hit the share button. takes one second. You can share it on social media with everybody, or you could email it or message it to somebody that it might be valuable. Now, today, I have the privilege of talking with Kurt, and I am really excited about this because he runs a really cool agency that does really cool stuff. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I went through your website, I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is like next level stuff that you guys are doing. So I'd love for you to start off on what kind of agency you guys r- run, your position there, and just give us a little bit of background. Yeah, so thanks, Gary. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm the president and also a partner at Foundry, and uh, we are a digital experience company. So we build and uh to design and develop custom uh, applications. So mobile applications, web applications. Uh, we're not a marketing company. We are the tool makers, if you will, right? So we build everything from configurators to custom ERP systems to e to all sorts of stuff. We're the people you call when something off the shelf just isn't gonna do it for your business. And that's so cool. So to g- give me a little bit of insight inside of the company. Like how big are you guys, revenue, yeah. team members, that kind of stuff? So yeah, we're we're growing pretty quickly. We're about forty people, about seven years old, <clears throat> and uh, so our team is made up of it's about twenty five percent strategists, twenty five percent design, and then the fifty percent development. So um, so we're end to end product. So a lot of times people come to us and say, "Hey, I want an app," and I say, "That's probably a bad idea. Let's figure out what you actually need." <laughs> Yeah. Um, so our uh, strategists will come in, help figure out what your business needs actually are, uh, help design what that roadmap looks like, interview and talk to customers, to employees, uh, and then work with your team. And then our design team can come in, build out the UX, UI, make sure it's something that's very modern, but also uh, follows accessibility standards. And then our development team can actually produce it. And so uh, we're usually in some stage of a, of a, of a build at any given time. Um, and there is a lot of times where we might just come in and just do design or we might just do strategy to help an organization. But um, the majority of our stuff is end to end. What, what kind of revenue, if, you, if you're allowed to share that, what kind of revenue do you guys do? Uh, that's a good question. It changes every year. So it's uh, <laughs> probably this year, it's somewhere between six to eight, I that's guess. Awesome. <laughs> That is awesome. So six to eight million, 40 team members. That's really, really good. Now walk me through like a project. So as you just described right there, I know people are hearing this and they're going, okay, well, how do I apply that? Or what, how are, how are you? Cause you're building websites, right? You're building or properties that are helping people do things. So what's the difference between you and somebody who's out there building websites for a marketing as a marketing agency. Sure, sure. So for us, a lot of times um, we're defining most of the work that we do. So versus a client who might come and say, "Well, I need a website that has uh, that has, has these many pages. Here's kind of an idea of the sitemap, or we need to refactor our website, or things like that." Um, many times it's well, we kind of use this spreadsheet to track things <laughs> between Salesforce. And uh, we, then we have these forms that people fill out on the ground. And then we have this sales enablement tool that also then sends PDFs. And we don't have any way to track or pull all this data mm-hmm. in a way that we can make sense of it. So that's where we come in to help create either maybe it's middleware or maybe it's a whole new dashboard, some sort of data visualization tool that allows mm-hmm. for 
anything from salespeople to track things more real time to um, helping them track inventory in a better in a better fashion than what they're doing currently. So um, where we differentiate a lot of that is that we are helping define what that solution should be versus the client coming to us and saying, here's the solution I need, how much to build it. Now, is this always an internal product that you're giving, uh, that you're building for people, or is it sometimes external for clients or customers yeah. as well? <clears throat> yeah, so we do a lot of customer facing applications, right? So one of our clients is True Green, for example. And so if you utilize, um, you know, True Green app or those types of things, like we've done a lot of the design for those things, we work mm-hmm. with a lot of financial institutions and med tech institutions or uh, companies. So um, there's a lot of things that are customer and patient facing um, that we do as well. But yeah, that's a good call out, Gary, because we do also do a lot of internal tools that help empower the employees to do a better job. Yeah. And I'll call this out for some of our listeners. Um, you know, you get to the point in your business where you kind of duct tape everything together and make things work. You got numbers over here, numbers over there. And yep. then it gets to the point where you have an army of people literally pulling data together just to get you an answer of this is where my company's at. Exactly. Those are the kind of things that you're coming in and helping with. So you're you're yes. pulling it from everywhere and putting it into one place. Yeah, and you'd be surprised. I mean, it's not just where you might think it's a small business that has these problems. One of our clients is General Mills. They have that problem too, yeah. where they have a lot of things contained in spreadsheets. And you would think this is a multi-billion dollar organization. Um, and Again, it's very rare that clients show up to us without already a solution to find, right? They're always like, I need an app, I need a website, I need a something. Um, we always challenge that because we, it, they're, this is not their expertise. Their expertise yeah. is in manufacturing or in- Well, if it was their expertise, they would have already done it, right? right like they exactly, went and, went right. and said, hey, Mr. Website person, build this and then we'll figure out the <laughs> right. data connects, right? But that's right. why they're coming so, to you. And, and so I get it. When you're small, you know, you're a little bit more afraid of those clients. So you're like, yes, yes, please. Can I have another uh, website build? So you'll do what they, what they want them to do. But um, what I found in agency after agency is that once you get in that point, that's when the clients leave or fire you six to eight months later because you yeah. did everything they said, but nothing they actually needed. You're not actually providing that value. Wow, that's so good. Yeah, and I, I we get this in the dental world all the time. People ask me why why are why have you been able to grow your dental marketing company to the size that it is? And it's literally because we don't listen to the dentist. Yeah, because they're dentist, right? right? And it's this same reason they don't. I don't go into my dentist and sit down and go, you know, what? my teeth are kind of, and you should do this to my teeth. I'm like, you guys tell me what I need in my teeth. I can't read X-rays. I don't know how to do any of that. And then whatever right. they tell me, I pretty much do because that's what they said and they're the dentist. So I think that's 100%. a really important lesson for people to understand when you have a, a service that you provide that you have to be the expert. Your clients don't know what they don't know. Right. And and again, you know, you might be dealing with, uh, especially nowadays because, you know, I'm, I'm much older. So I've dealt with when this was their first go round. So they were very, mm-hmm. um, a lot of clients were new to this sort of thing, but a lot of people have gone through a website build or some sort of uh, digital thing and been burned or had a bad experience or didn't like it. And so now they might come in in a couple of different ways. One way is they might stomp their feet and be like, I'm not doing this again. <clears throat> so what I want is exactly this, 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 and this. And that could be intimidating because you're like, yes, I want you to write a check. I want you to pay me for the work that I love to do. Um, and so you might say, okay, cool. And then like I said, four months later, you're in a death march project where you didn't define any of the um, actual items, and now they're at, they're demanding all these things that you're considering out of scope, even though um, you never actually set expectations because you were too scared of them to do so. So you've done this to yourself, and I sounds can't... like you've done this before, Kurt. Like, oh it no, sounds like I, I know this. Is, uh, it's total Me hypothetical, too. Gary. Um, <laughs> um, I didn't get good at this because I was just good at it. Um, I, I got it good at this because I screwed it up a lot early yeah. on when I was much younger. And so, you know, those things uh, are important because it sets your agency to a new level because they understand this is the place I go to for answers, not for web development. These yeah. are the people that provide me solutions, not code or design. So, so that, you want to be that trusted partner because then they're going to keep coming back to you. And even more importantly, they'll refer you. Yeah. And, and you really, what you did is you moved yourself from a commodity to an expert that you need, right? Because if you're just building a website and you're billing by the hour, then you're just a commodity because I can yeah. just go on Upwork and compare 
you know, $99 an hour, $79 an hour. They said this project's going to take this long and you know, that's, yep. that's the outcome. So just really shifting that. I, I love that mindset and I, I think it's so crucial in growing. In fact, I don't think you can grow without it. No. Now going, going back, you do, I'm, I'm looking at like true greens website that you guys built the platform that you built for them. Walk me through some of the client facing stuff that you build or not client, a uh, customer facing uh, stuff that you build, like w- the true green, which looks amazing. W- what did you do for them? Walk me through the process with how you help sure. them. So again, um, you know, a company like true green or some of these other ones, uh, they call up and they say, I need some UX design. And we're like, cool, let's talk about that. So we sit down, we find out what's actually going on. We ask a lot of questions. Uh, We don't do anything without a workshop up front where we are workshopping through um, what those issues uh, that they said there are so we can get our questions in there. And then what you come to find is What do you mean by workshop? Like, what do you mean by a workshop? Yeah, so, so all of our projects or all of our engagements start out with some version of a workshop. Um, so th- for two reasons. One, because I need to be able to ans- ask a lot of questions that um, I need to get sorted out um, before I can determine what the actual solution is. And number two, uh, I want to get paid for estimating work. I don't want to estimate work for free. So they have a complex solution. Um, if they want some sort of range, I can just give them a range based on experience, mm-hmm. right? I can just say, well, you know, an app can cost three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars. Oh, wow, that seems really expensive. Sure, it does because that's usually what people pay us to do those sorts of things. Well, I was thinking more like this. Oh, okay, cool. We can design to a budget too. Um, so let's get in a workshop and figure out Got what it. that looks like. So, so the workshops will be, um, you know, for something like. Uh, the true green thing is figuring out what is the actual problem you're trying to solve. Um, I get it. You want UX help. You want design help. What does that actually mean? Um, and and as you dig in and you have a, a a process for asking those questions, getting through that, then you can dig out what the actual problem is. So a place like Drew Green, for example, um, they don't have any internal design resources. Come to find out, there's nobody. All of it's outsourced. So there's a problem that yeah. uh, there's no there's no design process. There is whatever the person in charge has determined what the process is. So the value so there's is- no is brand now we control. Bring, right, there's exactly. No, yep, yeah, exactly. whatever. So now where I see the value is, is that we can bring in our design process as a value add to them. The way that we run design projects, the way that we run uh, demos, the way that, you know, the whole thing that goes alongside of the actual just making of wireframes and and visual design, that's a value to them to teach them um, how to actually do design work. And so that's the type of thing, once we do that, we get through that project, we're now their kind of agency of record, for, you know, for lack of a better term, um, that gets called every time there's new work that needs to be done in that area because they can trust us that we will just run it. Got it. And then so, and then how, how long is the lifespan for these kind of clients for you? Are these people that stick around for years and years, years. and years? Cause you, years. years. Okay. And then, well, and then the w- engagement will change. Sometimes it'll go dormant for a little bit because we'll ship something large and it might go dormant for a bit and maybe their internal team does a lot of the, uh, maintenance maybe. Um, mm-hmm. but then we'll, they'll ramp back up when new things come in because they've just got this trusted resource. So um, we have we have one client that we've had for seven years um, yeah. that we, and they have a full design and development team um, wow. internally. Um, we are their special teams, if you will, right? Yeah, that's awesome. And then do you, um, and then you guys figure out all the connections between like, like you said, their CRM, their sales Yeah, the integrations, force. everything, yeah. yep. So I'm not the person you want to call if you want to install Salesforce or if you yeah. want to install HubSpot. I understand, yeah. Or any of that sort of stuff, right? <laughs> uh, I'm the person that if you want to pull data between Salesforce and HubSpot and then pull it up in a live real-time dashboard for an iPad um, that can sync when it doesn't connect to Wi-Fi on the showroom floor, that's me. I've Got been, it. I'm the person who can make that happen. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And then do you, and then how, um, how long is like your onboarding process for when you're bringing yeah. on somebody new? <clears throat> well, it depends on the size of the project, but usually um, if it's a large, more transformational project, it can be months. It can be three to four months of auditing their current tech- technical stack, right? Figuring out 
what have they done already, right? We're, we're right now, we're in the middle of an audit with a company, a mid-sized company that has, I don't know, a dozen URL URLs and different properties and three different uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, four different scheduling platforms and LMS. Um, it's all Frankenstein together. So it's gonna take us months to untangle all that and then come up with a long-term uh, three to five year roadmap for where they should be going. And then, uh, but then most of our projects, um, it's just a few weeks to really get through those workshops and come up with that roadmap and hit the ground running. And then what we're doing is we're doing uh, usually two week sprints. So every two weeks we're demoing where we're at with things and we're making adjustments and modifying as yeah. we go. That's awesome. Now I'm gonna take you back a little bit. So I, yeah. I'm assuming you didn't start like this, right? <laughs> How did you start? Cause a lot of the people that are gonna be listening are not doing, you know, $500,000 a month or, you sure. know, whatever. So where, how did you start your agency? And then tell me about kind of that morphing process. Cause I, I think sometimes I know for me, I was like, I need everything perfect. I got to have all this stuff. And then oh, yeah. I realized I started in email marketing for restaurants. I'm now in yeah. group dental marketing. Like right. it's weird. Right? <laughs> right. So it's like, so how, how did that happen? That more? Yeah. Well, the opportunity that we first saw in the, in the get go was, uh, that we were going to be sort of the pace car for people that already had teams. So what we were finding opportunities is, is that if you have a design and development team, uh, but they're so busy just keeping the lights on that all the new stuff, the fancy new stuff, shiny stuff that the CEO wants to do, the team is always pushing back on them and it's very frustrating for them. So we're the team that can come in and then sort of launch new features for your SaaS platform or whatever. That's how we were gonna kind of bill ourselves as, right? And then, um, and it worked out really well for, for a while, but again, um, because they already had a team, we were kind of looked at as a real high overhead, real high expenditure, uh, almost staff augmentation-y in, in a number of respects, right? So we were looked at, back to your earlier point, we were very much commoditizing ourselves um, because what we were doing is we were asking for tickets to be assigned to us and then we were doing work. So the, while we were calling ourselves an agency, it wasn't much different than a staff augmentation thing. Um, you know, if you really- and What do you mean by that staff? Do you basically mean you're like a backup for if they don't have time to design the thing? Yeah, basically, yeah. They like hand it off to our designer and they will do stuff and they'll fill out their timesheet and you can look at it. And So you, you, you know. kind of, and, and I think that happens a lot, right? If we're not it careful, does. we will yep. commoditize ourselves. Like we'll be like, oh, well, I paint a house and to paint a house, it's a thousand dollars or whatever it is. And it once you get in that game, there's it's just whoever is the lowest, and it's a race to the bottom, and that's a bad place to be. It's hard to do because staff, you know, honestly, staff augmentation places make a lot of money. So you're an owner, and you're seeing the money roll in, and you don't have to do a lot of work because the work is just being assigned from the client to your team. Great, like I've got less to do, right? And and uh, and I'm and I'm, and I'm making a bunch of money. But then what you find out is that they'll dump you in two mm -hmm. seconds two for seconds. something yeah. cheaper, or yeah. they'll they'll hire one more person internally and replace your entire team. Like you're you're so uh, you could be replaced in no time, and then there goes all that revenue, right? <clears throat> is, so, is, is that what kind of happened with you guys? Is that you, did you start there to see was a that? scare, right? Because we did have one client early on that was probably two thirds of their revenue from that respect. And then they brought in a new CTO that started talking about, um, you know, reducing overhead <laughs> and yep. we could tell what that meant. Um, and when we were going out then back to, uh, cause we were so busy focused on that client, we weren't doing a lot of marketing and sales and all those other things, um, that we turned around and we're looking over our shoulder going, Oh, where's the next opportunity? And it's like crickets, you know? Yeah. Um, and so we, we circled up and we figured out, um, you know, we really need to start getting um, uh, a position out there um, because we started talking to the client and asking them, well, where's the real value in the work that we do? Well, mm. I really liked it when Nick uh, looks at our stuff and says, that's really dumb. Don't do it that way. <laughs> yeah. You know, or it's I like more it strategic. When, yeah. When, and, and so what I found was talking to the client is that, yeah, the work we're getting done was great, but what they really loved was that our team had opinions and shared them with them. Which and you probably you did you didn't have any infrastructure for that, right? No. Yeah. Not at the time, no, not at all. And we didn't even have a way to talk about it. Yeah. So um so what happened was is that I eventually started uh 
turning the ship more towards, um, you know what, let's, let's get Nick in front of more people to give his opinion to folks. So what I started doing is going out and offering this free workshop, like two hours in an afternoon in a whiteboard with me, Nick and Jason, uh, our lead designer and one of our lead engineers. And hey, you got a problem? Like just come in and let's let's work, workshop like, it. It'll like in a free. in a building, like people would come to the building. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Okay. And people would yep. show up and be like, "Yeah, I got these web problems." What what year was this? Uh, 2017, 2018. Okay. So not that not not like it wasn't like not early early ago, day no. webs. Yeah. Okay. No. <clears throat> and uh, what happened was is that uh, you know either we would design a solution that we could actually work on with the potent with the prospect right there. Or um, they would be so impressed they'd tell their tell their friends, and then I would take the experiences from that and turn that into social posts or marketing posts or blog posts or different things about ways that we were solving these problems. And so I was kind of using this. F and then what happened was eventually I started charging for those those workshops. So I started charging a thousand dollars for the workshop, and then I started charging five thousand for the workshop. And now our workshops start thirty five to forty. Um, that's where they start. So um, I pay you 35,000 and you're going to give me some solutions, but not necessarily a product, right? No, I'm not going to deliver anything other than what you should build. Got it. Okay, you know? cool. And then, and then do you, and that's 35,000 per company that's doing them. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then, so then from, which is awesome. Uh, so, cause those are all like just pure profit, right? So, or besides yeah, the labor. For the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then walk me through the process of, um, how you guys started to really focus on who to help because yeah. here's the thing everybody I'm big on niching down right but yeah. there's different ways to niche down so for me I either want to be really service driven to one industry so dentist mm -hmm. or as an example or car washes or whatever or yep. I want to have one thing I do really well for everybody because that's a niche too right right do you fit in either of those camps or you fall in the middle or where, what are your thoughts on that yeah, I would say we probably lean a little bit more to the latter, right? Is that is that what we what we do is is even though it's new every time, like what we do is custom things. Like mm -hmm. we're not the place to install Sitecore or WordPress or any of you know or any of those things. If you need platform help, like we have lots of partners um, mm -hmm. that we can pull in um, and that can help you. Uh, we are when there is no solution um, that you can find or the solutions you have are working and your business is unique and it needs a unique technology solution. So we're the people that, that make those things happen. So, but to your point, um, what I started finding was, is there was industries that we were exceptional in mm. and we started really focusing on those because we had great stories and we had great referrers. So financial services, med tech and ag tech are probably our three biggest and ag verticals. tech is um, agricultural yeah, technology. Agriculture, yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so, um, but what's funny about that, Gary, is that they all kind of need the same things. Yeah. They, they all, um, have never taken design very seriously. It's been a nice to have, um, not a must have. Um, but they all understand the value of it. They just don't know how to do it. Um, their teams are overloaded. They're understaffed. Um, I could go on and on. I have a whole checklist of, of things that would explain. So to your point, um, our niche is more people that are in this certain um, channel, mm -hmm. and it could be in the med tech, it could be in manufacturing, but their client profile fits this uh, situation. Um, so, like I said, most of our clients have a some development resources. They might not have a design team, but they have some developers. Um, I got it. And they've used the developers to solve a problem, which is not a solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so question. So I know right now, one of the hardest things to do is to get highly skilled developers yeah. to come and not just work with you, but a lot of times you're partnering with them. How, yeah. and you're, and that's like crucial to what you do. 100%. You can't just get somebody who's from overseas and just knows how to move yep. some <laughs> things from A to B. You have to have people who are actually able to communicate or, or no, even back up, you have to be able to see the pain that the customer's in and articulate a solution back to them that they're going to be like, okay, here's all my money because yes. this, this would be awesome if you guys can build that. And then they have to actually deliver it. So how, are, yep. do, how do you solve the labor side of that? Um, yeah. what, how are you guys tackling that? 
Yeah, I love that you brought that up because um, it's it's a it's a mantra we've had at Foundry since the beginning, which is always be hiring. <laughs> we are always yeah. hiring, even when we're not. We don't have an open position. We are hiring, so we are you know, we are always in conversations with people. Um, I'm always recruiting. Uh, do you recruit nationally or locally or mostly locally? Um, we do most of all of our uh, staff is full time salaried employees. Um, we don't do any contractors. We do have uh, like one part time person, uh, and uh, in um, we have an office in New York, and uh, that that office has just three people in it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's our it, we just opened it a year ago, so it's it's going to grow slowly. Yeah. Um, but to that point, uh, we're always out hiring and talking to people. So part of our marketing strategy is we sponsor a lot of events, especially in events that follow our values. So we sponsor a lot of uh, women who code, DEI, uh, blacks in tech. Um, uh, and this is more for recruiting, right? We're not talking about marketing for customers. You're That's probably a bigger bottleneck is bot- your team rather than customers at this point, correct? Yeah, in a lot of ways, yeah. And so for us, um, because again, like Amazon and Target and these places, they can pay a lot more than I can. So they can throw money at people. I can't afford Amazon uh, developer salaries. So what I have to provide is a better environment and work life um, than what Amazon can provide. So how are they going to learn that and trust that? Well, they got to get to know us. So sometimes our hiring process takes a year. We'll meet someone and they might be kind of casually looking, but we don't have an open position. Um, We'll just keep talking with them, meet them up for a happy hour every quarter, uh, me and my CEO and and, or me and one of my uh, one of the other engineers or something. And we just we just um, so everybody's everybody's behind that mantra. We're always hiring. And I, I, I really like that. And then also just for the newer agency owners out there that might be listening right now your biggest obstacle is customers, right? So it's just like, I just gotta get customers, that's all I need. But then it ends up being team members is the next yeah. thing that you need, right? Cause right. you need to fulfill the work and it's this constant cycle. And the more technical your work is, the harder that game becomes. So you yeah. could be the best at whatever you do, but if you don't have any developers, you, you're not gonna be able to perform the job. So it, it's it's a it's an interesting thing. Business is an interesting thing the way that kind of plays out. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, and it's 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 it cool sure the way is. you guys are it's cool the way you guys are tackling it. One of the things I heard you say is that you want to make sure that your values align. And again, for yeah. younger agencies, when you're first starting out, you're just like, we're just a startup. Let's go, right? And we it's do just work energy. For money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then, but then you have to to retain your team members. You have to build a culture that people want to work at. 100%. So how how do you guys approach that? Yeah, so that you know, it's funny you say that because early on, um, when we were smaller, uh, you know, me and my partners, we just kind of handled that, right? Like we would um, we'd come up with ideas for. Uh, we did like uh, pub tours on our bikes, like around downtown or. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, Nils, you know, one of my partners, who's the CEO would just, you know, he'd break out in Nerf gun fights and during the office day and stuff. So we, you know, we did a really good job early on, but as we got bigger, um, we, we brought in some people specifically to help with that and then told them that's your, your role. Um, your role is, and you are, you, uh, you're judged on re- retention of I- employees. And, yeah. Team members. What's their, yeah. uh, what's their title? Do they have like a chief culture officer or yeah, director direct- of people, director of people. Okay. And director so that's their, and their KPI is, is team member retention, right? Team member retention. So they're always looking for ways to engage the staff, but they are also working them individually on training ideas, right? So they want to go to a conference. Um, so they're coming to me and saying, what's my conference budget for this year? And, uh, you know, so I can send people to learn about stuff or these people want to take this online course. Okay, cool. Let's bring it up at all staff and see if any. Other so they're more like a, almost like a um, advocate, kind of like HR would be. But HR yep. kind of has a nasty sometimes. It connotation. does. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it has a terrible nomenclature. But, um, you know, in our business, HR has to, you know, in other businesses, HR is usually protecting the business from its employees. Um, in our thing, um, uh, the HR person, the director of people is to hold us accountable for the promises we make to our employees. So that's the way that we have it set up. Um, I love so that. Do you have any KPIs built out besides uh, the, like around that that you, you can talk about? 
Yep. So again, it's about how much uh, we've kind of tracked, like how much it costs uh, to uh, re- to hire a person, right? Like mm-hmm. we've got an idea of what that percentage of versus salary is, and then what it costs to replace a person and how much that might be. Um, and then we look at and we kind of use that as our budgeting tool for how much we're going to reinvest into the culture in terms of anything from fancy stuff like better speakers in the office to buying nicer webcams for everybody because they're working from home or better laptops for everybody. Um, Those things go into all of those uh, sorts of decisions on where we're investing in a better uh, quality of life for the employee. That's awesome. I love I love this conversation. I think this is really at the crux of every successful scaling business. Well, and again, what- you know, that's the advice I give you. You know, you're not going to figure it out and there's no like what, you know, it's like I tell people that, um, you know, suffer from imposter syndrome or things like that. Um, there's there's millions of books on it. If there was one way to solve it, there'd be one book and you would just yeah. read that. Yeah, you would yep. just read that one book. It'd be a math <clears throat> book, right? One plus one equals two every single exactly. time, right? But, yeah, and it's yep, not but that in, simple. In, in business and in people and in these things, like there is no one size fits all. So, you know, there's never a state, and you could probably attest to this, Gary, that, and I coach my leaders um, at the company, is that there's never going to be a perfect state. There will always be grooming. We just yeah. live in a constant state of grooming. We don't... So, it's, yeah, it's ahead, all about the journey and not about the destination. That's so good. So yeah, I I struggle with this all the time, right? It's something yeah. I have to fight. And one of the, the mental models that I was presented that really helped me with this is that when I first started in business, I treated everything like sports, right? So it's like, I got to sure. win. I want to win yeah. all the time. Yep. I never want to lose. I want to be the best. I want to beat them. I want to be better than them. And, and I read the book, uh, Simon Sinek, The Infinite Game. Yes. And he presented this, this basically this framework, like that's a fixed game where you have winners and losers and a scoreboard and everybody actually knows that they're playing. So guess what? You're playing a game that nobody else knows that you're playing. Right. Nobody else is and playing it, your game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's no rules either. There's not yep. like a set rule that I'm beating you or you're beating me. You don't, might not even know I exist. And so right. you have to get to this place where I'm actually competing against myself and it's an infinite game that's going to keep going long after I'm gone. And if you just have small incremental growth yourself, like everything kind of works out and you just keep growing and it keeps compounding and you can get to the place where you're doing, you know, millions of dollars a year in business and you, it just keeps growing and getting better. But if you don't get in that mindset, then you you kind of fall into a trap. And I, I lived there for a long, long time. Um, it's it's I think that's a big problem. It's very, it's very common because, you know, it, it's, it seems, especially where I've seen agencies that are started by engineers, they have a very engineering <laughs> approach to solving problems, right? I'll create a spreadsheet, I'll add up some math, I'll do these things, and then I'll eventually engineer it into the ground where it will just work for me. And designers will do the same thing. Designers, if it's a design agency and they started, you know, um, they're like, well, if I just put enough good vibes out into the world, it'll, um, it'll come back, karma is great. Um, and the thing is, is there's a balance between both of them that you you have to find. And so I'm always telling engineer led um, agency or, or engineer founding agencies, like find a designer to help join you um, to help balance, you know, your engineering brain or designers find an engineer that can help root uh, you into some more reality. And, you know, you need a balance, especially in the creative work that we do, because um, the work that we do, there is. It does have to inspire and excite people, but it has to work. You know, the websites you build, Gary, they have to perform. They have to load within a certain amount of time. Otherwise, Google's going to throw you out the door. So so it's the same with us. But you you can't do those things without the balance between the technology and the great design. If you look at Apple, if you look at Tesla, you look the easy ones to pick out from. um, You've got great design and you've got great engineering. Um, that all come together. And that's what makes a good company. And you don't need to be the size of Apple to do it. You can be three people in your mom's basement and still have that great balance. I have so many dentists that come to me and say, you know what, I just want a website and I want it to look like Apple's. Yep. And I'm like, oh, you sell products. And they're like, no, 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 we do dental. And I'm like, oh, so you want me to build you a product website for dental? I don't get it, right? Like yeah. it's so funny, but um, oh no, they, you and again we've done those workshops, and it basically comes down to oh, you like parallax scrolling? Okay, <laughs> that's Great. so good. That's awesome. We can, so, we can we can make it parallax scroll. It's fine. <laughs> 
if if you've ever built websites before, then this is really funny to you. If you've never gone through that process before, then it's not funny. So um, <laughs> that is so good. So um, so do you tell me about the future? Like, where are you guys yeah. going? Then, like, how do you see this year unfolding? What's next year and the year after that look like? Yeah, well, with the recession uh, and th those things happen, um, you know, I'm actually a bit excited because um, every agency that I've been a part of in my 25 years does really well in a recession. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, the work doesn't stop, but people stop hiring. So there's less people internally to do the work and the work is still there. So they bring you. So people like us, agency people actually are more attractive because you can look at it and be like, oh, I could just eliminate that from my balance sheet next month versus a whole team of people. Uh, so we look like a safer bet in a lot of respects. So I'm always coaching agency owners, like a time of recession is a time to double down on getting your name out there and getting people to be aware of you. So I look at it as a growth um, year, another or another growth year, and I'm very excited about that. Um, but our ultimate goal is to kind of be more of a version of an IDEO, um, you know, in the Midwest, I guess. Um, so a place where people are coming to solve business problems and technology just happens to be a factor in those things. So, um, you know, I would love to be designing the next uh, version of Ford Lightning's uh, heads up display, um, you know, five years from now. I would love, Ooh. you know, to be um, to be and helping them implement those things and understanding those changes that need to happen. Um, uh, you know, I'd love to be working in um, medical uh, records and helping improve the patient experience, uh, you know, and making it more seamless. We do. We also we we've done a lot of virtual healthcare applications over the last year where, you know, doctors are be able to interface directly with patients via an application, secure, HIPAA, HIPAA compliant, all of so those cool. things. Yeah. So, so just. Oh, go ahead. Keep going. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, really so those, the, for me, I want people coming us saying we have these opportunities as a business. How can we leverage technology for us to, um, to, to make those things happen versus where we're getting there, but versus we still get a number of people showing up saying, I want an app. How much for an app? You know, and I want to <laughs> well, get. The, the the HIPAA get away stuff from is that, so cool right? because I, I, I know that's so well and it's so broken. Healthcare is so, yep. so, so broken across the board. And every time I go to the doctor, I have to fill out a new form and I have yes. go to my dentist and it's in my yep. chiropractor and it shouldn't be that way. Like I should mm -hmm. own my information. I should be able to walk in, scan something. Here's all my stuff. I don't have to fill it out and nope. answer the 7,000 nope. questions again. And yeah, nope. I you should be able to just put your iPhone on a thing and go boop. And then there's your health records. Doesn't matter where you go, if you're in urgent care or doctor. And there's people out there working on these solutions. But the problem is, is that in these areas, this is not a technology problem. It's a cultural problem. Yep. Um, and it's a politics problem. So you have to be able to go in and bring teams together because they're so siloed in these large organizations like healthcare companies, um, even all the, all the whichever. So what you have to understand is as, as the work that we do, you, when you're coming in, a lot of times what you're doing is helping build a culture around these solutions, not just delivering on the solution. And once you realize that that's really your, your, your special sauce, is that mm -hmm. you make them better as an organization. You don't just deliver a website. Um, that's when you your game levels up. Yeah, and the other thing too, the reason that I think it's roadblocked is number one, it, um, the clinical folks that are involved with it are technicians, right? Yep. So they exactly. they yep. approach things from a very like 100%. technical way. Then you also have competing interest. So a lot of the businesses that are in place don't want you to pull the data because once you're able to pull, get an API and get a direct all the data directly to something else, then they go out of business because they already know they it's not a good product, right? It, they're just there because they're they've been there, they were there first, and so you have and then you have insurances and all of this other yes. stuff too on top of it, right? So then now you have all these competing interests, and really at the center, the patient or the customer, if you will is not the main focus. It's no. really all these competing interests fighting over the, the the money. And so that's what makes it so interesting. And I love that you're going in that direction. I, I, I have, we could spend a whole nother hour just on that one topic. <laughs> what, um, what are, tell me a little bit about your podcast. I've listened to it. Yeah, where, where can people find you and kind of learn from you? Cause I think you have a wealth of knowledge to be able to help people. Uh, thank you, Gary. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I started a podcast about four or five years ago and 
Um, it's called Schmidt List. Um, I was going to I was going to name it Schmidt Show because I thought that's what it's kind of like being in the agency and technology world. Um, but I found like somebody else had it already. So my wife uh, said to me, "Well, you've got this big list of uh, leaders in technology and design you want to talk to. Uh, you should just it'd be funny if you call them up and ask them to be on your Schmidt List." So I was like, "Cool, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it that." So I did uh, because I just didn't like the idea of calling it like the leadership podcast of America, like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like I yeah. just wanted something people would remember. And, and also to re re remind myself that I, I don't need to take myself too seriously when it comes to this stuff. So, so, so for me, it's been an amazing tool for me personally, uh, for personal growth. And so I do the show, uh, I, it's been an audio podcast for a number of years and about a year or two ago, I started live streaming it mm. via YouTube and, and LinkedIn, just because um, with the pandemic. Um, I always yeah. wanted video to be a part of it, Gary, but yeah. the problem was nobody would come on camera. But once the pandemic hit, like everybody's like, okay, yeah, sure. What time? <laughs> like yeah. it was great. Everybody yeah. was on camera and I didn't have to worry about it anymore. So I just thought, well, why not live stream it? And that's been super valuable. And uh, it's taught me a lot personally uh, and helped me grow personally. But it's also been a great tool for networking and meeting people and, uh, and uh, getting referrals and all these different things. So yeah, yeah, it's Schmidt, Schmidt List. You can find anywhere podcasts are, uh, but it's also on YouTube. You can subscribe and check it out there. So Awesome. And if someone wants to le learn more about what you guys are doing, how do they yeah. find you? How do they connect with you? Yeah, so the company's name is Foundry. Um, you can check out foundrymakes.com, as in we make we make things better by design. So, um, and uh, we, we, we've got a lot of webinars coming up this year. Um, where we're going to be talking a lot about the work that we do, and we're actually going to be showing how we do a lot of the work. We're going to be teaching a lot of our workshop techniques and uh, a lot of those sorts of things. So if you go to foundrymakes.com and sign up for the newsletter there that's in the footer, um, you'll get alerts on when those webinars and those types of things will be starting. And uh, yeah, I'd love for people to come and check it out or just find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always posting there all the time. So um, I'd love to connect with people and chat. I'm always open up. For a conversation yeah one thing okay so number one i'm signing up for that workshop because i want to come to that so i'm like literally <laughs> scrolling right now i'm signing up for it so that's Sign number up. one and then and then uh, one thing i can say about kurt is, and the reason that we're even connected here today is he just gives 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 and even if it doesn't directly benefit him at that moment he's just going to keep giving i really appreciate that a lot of the stuff that you've dropped has helped me personally. And oh, so, you, yeah, most definitely. And and I just appreciate your willingness to share, be open, share the bad parts, the good parts. And oh, not everybody I'm does that. To share all, all the <laughs> yeah. dirty, dirty laundry. And, you know, to be honest, part of it is is kind of giving back to my uh, younger self, because when I was younger, you know, I really wanted to be a part of a blue chip agency. And I, and I felt a little gate kept, right? I felt a little bit like I couldn't, I wasn't the cool enough to go and work at these agencies. And I had to really scrounge my way up to get to where I'm at today. So, um, you know, it wasn't super easy for me. I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, just fall into working in very cool agencies. And so for me, um, you know, I love chatting with people and coaching other agency owners because um, I know, I know where they're at. I know the feelings that they're having. And it's a lot of emotional labor, the work that they do. So, um, so to me, it's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, uh, self care in a way. Sometimes when I'm giving that advice, I may yeah, sound so weird, but I'm sure you, were, you get it. Oh, I totally get it. When I when you were talking about the recession being a time to grow, every time after COVID we shrunk and then we grew like we like four x in a year. Yeah. Um, I started in 2008. Everybody was firing everybody at that time, which <laughs> yeah. gave me an opportunity to step in and be like, well, you still kind of need a little bit of marketing and gave me my foot in my door. Yep. Um, and so, but there was no resources when I started, there was yeah. no YouTube I could go to and how to build an agency or how does, no. how, what kind, there was nothing. And you had to totally guess and just hope for the best. And yeah. And, then, and because, because typically, and I see this today, Gary, and you probably, you would probably agree with me, these more established agencies, they don't talk to each other. Um, because they assume the, the agency owner mindset is that there is a finite amount of work out there and I have to get it all. If yep. somebody else gets it, that means I lost something. So you yep. had talked about this earlier, which is completely backwards. There's so much work out there. Um, and the people who do a good job, they win. The people who do a bad job, they lose. Sorry, yeah. it's that simple. Yeah, so, and it's not. It's almost like the way that people think about it is like I sell, um, I sell like uh, horseshoes. 
for horses and there's only a thousand horses in our town <laughs> right right it's not that way anymore because not. There, we don't just have horses anymore like mm-hmm. if you just pivot 10 percent and look this way all of a sudden there's i just I, yeah. I did a podcast with a guy his agency what they do is they teach people business owners how to find opportunities to speak in public to get business for their businesses and yeah. he trains them gets them out there and then teaches them how to post on Sounds social media super fun like I'm like I've never heard of that before. Like yeah, he just right. thought of something that <laughs> that that was an opportunity that wasn't there yesterday. There's there's right. infinite amount of opportunities. The way you're doing your company, someone else could just pivot ten percent the other direction, exactly. and you guys could be best friends and both grow and reach all of your goals. Exactly. So that's why you know I appreciate the work you're doing, Gary, by helping uh, young agency owners and new agency owners kind of help build their businesses because. There isn't those communities out there. I mean, there is agency communities where you got to pay thousands of dollars a year to be a, a part of and go to a couple meetings. Um, and those things are those things are great. But again, those places can be intimidating because you're sitting around with all these, uh, you know, established agency gray hairs um, that you don't want you, you to. Plus, you have to have thousands. Plus, you have to have thousands of dollars to go to it. Right. Like you're there trying you to build go. your yes, business. Exactly. And, and, and hopefully you get some real talk out of it and that's very rare unless you're at the bar at the hotel late at night that's when you get the real interesting information so So for me that's what we're trying to build like with age agency growth engine is what we're calling it now with that community i'm just like i'm gonna give it to you guys and it's gonna be free and it's gonna and we already have people that are doubling their agencies and stuff it's been honestly so rewarding like i I just love it and we haven't got anything back from it yet but that's it's not why we're doing it no, no. Again, it's back to, you know, um, like I said, for me, the same thing I do because I do a lot of career coaching. I do a lot of coaching with agency owners. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of ADP List, which is a worldwide mentorship program. I was That's mentoring cool. a guy in Nigeria yesterday. Um, and uh, it's like I don't get anything out of it other than some validation that the mistakes that I made <laughs> and, and learned from yep. were valuable. And you know what? That's enough for me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. The one I'll leave you with this stat. Um, the I think seventy five percent of children coming out of high school right now want to be YouTubers, and which yes. you know and I know that that's not possible. We can't have more influencers than uh, than people, right? Like no. you can't. So you got it. Someone has to buy the stuff, right? Like just, they do. Everybody can't be selling it. So I think a lot of these people are going to end up pivoting to agency work. Because they're, oh, yeah. it's just going to keep being more and more opportunities, how to grow your YouTube, how to grow your TikTok, how to grow your business or whatever it may be. Yes. Um, and so I just see like all these opportunities for stuff. Yeah, I mean, you guys are a perfect example. You're, you're doing work for agricultural companies that probably 50 years ago wasn't even a problem, right? Or what didn't even exist or anybody could have thought of. And that's just going to keep developing and rolling out. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm excited about what you're doing. Me too. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Kurt. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to drop this for everybody. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I I love the work you're doing. So thank you again for the opportunity. 